further question about um, the intellectual culture. Um, it it's um, a theory in anthropology that um, in all um, almost all situations there's a, a competition which means that people feel if someone else does well, you do badly. I mean, in mathematics, it's zero-sum games. In anthropology, it's limited good. And in India, it's the frogs in the well syndrome. Um, and in a lot of universities I've visited, they said this is the kind of competition within the group. And so, um, and this is what happened at school, obviously, or preparatory school, you know, the jealousy and competition. Um, but as far as I see, Cambridge seems to be have an expansive enough system to, on the whole, mean that you feel that when your friends do well, you do well. That there's a mirror, mirroring. I don't know whether that's your impression within your lab. I, I hope it is. Mm. I, I think it's possibly naturally something which should, where the overall benefit Mm. is more obvious where there is a, a sort of need to work together collectively. Mm. So it's sort of self-evident to, I would say, most members of, of, of the research group that to be able to turn to other people who are doing extremely well with what they do and learning how to do it from them is far better than them not being there mm. and not being able to call on that expertise. Mm. And most of them, most of the time, see that the opportunities for them when they've uh, got their PhDs are very good and that they're probably not in competition with anybody else for anything very particular. Hmm. And I, I think it's all right, but, but you're right, behind that there is a sense of there being a zero-sum game and I suppose if you're after one of very few academic positions hmm. uh, that might be going around in the UK, then rather more concerned about these things but of course in general research groups in Cambridge are very international mm. and the, the stage um, the different stages that the members of the group might be playing towards um, are just, just very different doesn't mm. they don't need to be in competition mm. yes I think that openness to the world in general helps I mean there's a lot of smaller universities in rather remote places the pool is very small and if you're not doing well in it or someone else does well in it, it affects you rather more than Cambridge where you can move out. And well, Cambridge physics has always been very international. Mm. I mean, the, the international mix has changed with time and we've benefited through uh, membership of the EU. Uh, we've done very well from that. I'm mm. sure in previous times we did very well through the Commonwealth and before that the Empire. Mm. But it's never been a very British only sort of place. Mm. Mm. Um, you talked about collaboration within the group. Um, certainly in my subject and in a lot of the arts and humanities, the people have commented on the advantages or disadvantages of having a collegiate structure alongside a departmental and faculty structure in terms of collaboration or at least exchanging ideas with people in neighbouring fields. Have you? Do you think the college, this is another way of saying, do you think the college system helps in your subject? Um, in any way? Not much. <laughs> well, you're out I, in West Cambridge, is he? <laughs> well, I, I have, I mean, I have had, I, I've, of course, had some very good contacts mm. through my membership of St John's. Mm. I, I think the division between high table and the rest is absolutely outdated and mm. stupid. I, I would far rather feel that if I turn up for lunch somewhere, um, I am just as likely to be sitting next to a graduate student as, as a mm. colleague who probably wants to bend my ear about something rather trivial. Mm. Well, we have abolished it in Kings, you'll be glad to hear, at lunch uh, anyway. I am aware that not all colleges are as backward as, uh, <laughs> as, as some that I've been associated with, and mm. I, I have to say I don't find much time to do, mm. to do things in college now. Hmm. Is the fact that uh, the sciences have moved well out of the centre of Cambridge, has that had much effect, do you think? Because when the old Cavendish was there, the, the college and the Cavendish were very close. 
Well, the new Cavendish um, building, of course, is absolutely ghastly and it's already falling down. But it does have a good canteen. It mm. does, uh, which I mean, well, it, it, it suffers from not having the subsidy that college kitchens have mm. um, through uh, stealing money off students with so-called kitchen fixed charges. So there is a pricing problem, but it's pretty good, and it's far enough away that a lot of people will stay uh, over for lunch mm. in, the, in, in the departmental canteen, and that's usually where I have lunch, and I do get to have the sort of informal conversations with mm. you know, whoever that way, and I think you need to have that combination of the sort of formal relationship mm. and the informal, mm. because science is not about, you know, it's not a military sort of command structure. The mm. Ideas and uh, observations come from everybody, mm. and you need to, to have broken to have a sense of sort of social equality, um, a, a sort of social ease amongst everyone in the group, mm. so that no one is too timid to come forward with an idea. Mm. Does it go on into the evenings at all, the social life, or does it stop? At social life, uh, the canteen is not open in the evening, mm. um, so social life. Do you have a, a pub? There is no, the, the, we used to have um, a, a dreadful Bernie Inn, which mm. then became a McDonald's, this is on Madeley Road, and mm. now been turned into some bijou flats. Um, mm. So there is nothing, there's no r useful, uh, accessible social space other than heading into town. So um, I, the e evenings are not so obviously. Because um, the, 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 I'm a great believer in the eagle myth, um, you know, that after mm. a hard day mm. in the lab at mm. the Cavendish, walking over and having a pint of beer and relaxing and mm. trying out fanciful hypotheses with your friends in a more relaxed way makes a lot of difference. I, I, I agree. And actually, the, the research students and mm. postdocs are very good at uh, arranging mm. sort of group, group, group evenings. I can't say I'm that good at mm. going on too, but it doesn't sort of spill instantly out of you know, end of work in the afternoon and to mm. what's going on in the evening. And yes, I think we probably have lost something from being out in West Cambridge, but in other ways we've gained because we have reason to stick around over lunch. So mm. that, that works. Mm. And there are other subjects. I mean, it's not just physicists you know, out there. So. Well, for the first while it was us and the vets. Mm. <laughs> A lot of exchange there. Yeah. Yeah, of course, it is changing now. Mm. Um, mm. The, the significant parts of engineering, um, computer laboratory, the science building brings people from chemistry. Mm. It's, it is changing. Mm. Tell, tell me something more about your own work. I mean, I think, I think it was probably Gabriel Horn, I guess, who, or Simon Schaffer, who suggested I talk to you. Mm. And they immediately drew my attention to your work on um, display screens, uh, CDT or whatever the firm is called, mm -hmm. and particularly the potentials of making new forms of screen that you can yes. roll up and so on. Yes. Can, can you tell me something about that? Because I, I boast about it to people, saying, oh, we in Cambridge are doing this, but I have no idea what I should be saying, really. Well, the, uh, uh, of course, the, the sort of story of my um, having descended into doing applied physics, um, allegedly, is always more complex. My original interest was that it was becoming possible to get access to um, synthetic molecular materials, um, polymers turn out to be rather convenient to handle, which could be sort of simultaneously molecular but also semiconducting. And one of the best things you can do with a semiconductor want to work out whether, I mean, what, the, what the electrons do when they're pushed around is to put it into a semiconductor device it would make a transistor and hope that it works or make a diode or something like that. So the original interest actually uh, in a rather sort of grand way was to sort of uh, if you like borrow ideas about how you can assemble structures from biology and um, how you can then get those structures to be very functional and borrowed from the world of silicon. And uh, that's a rather grand <laughs> uh, uh, way of putting it. Uh, and the original structures we were uh, we, we made uh, were actually made purely to explore 
what we might find. So the, the, the transistor, which we first got working in 1988, was a tool mm. to understand how actually when you start moving electrons around, uh, unlike the case of silicon where they travel just by themselves, mm -hmm. and the, the lattice of silicon at atoms remains in place. If you do that with a molecular system, you disturb the positions of all the carbon atoms, and that makes a big difference to how things move. Mm. And our transistors were uh, absolutely useless for any practical application, but they showed beautiful characteristics, and we managed to get some very clean science out of that, which um, I was very happy about. We then um, were looking for something else, but chanced upon this uh, discovery that we could get uh, uh, diode structures to emit light. Uh, initially it was green light from the particular semiconducting polymer we were working with. And that was sort of obviously important because it was obvious that we could not just make one but make lots of them coated over a large area. So we, we did what I knew one had to do, which was to go and file a patent. And filing a patent is the sort of start of the process, not the end. Uh, within a, a couple of years, in various ways, we'd had uh, a lot of support from members of the, of the Cambridge community outside the university, and we got a company organised to exploit it. Was Herman Hauser involved in this? Herman Hauser um, and I overlapped as research students in the Cambridge. Mm. And Herman was not, not initially involved, but, but later has come to mm. be a wonderful supporter of all of this. Mm. He's raised quite a lot of venture. Capital. Herman has done mm. a lot to change the face of Cambridge. Mm. Uh, uh, has created a lot of opportunity. I referred to him as a friend, uh, a Polish man, Jan, mm. the other day, who seemed to know you mm. as a venture capitalist. And he said, no, he's not bad. He's, a, he's an industrialist. He's you know, much more than just a raiser of money. Ah, yes. Um, I, I should use my words very carefully. Yes, uh, it, it, it is... Um, it wasn't you who said it, it was me yes. who said it. Yes. Well, venture capitalist is, is sometimes used pejoratively, mm. but, but it's not just a matter of money. It's a matter of understanding what the mm. vision for what mm. the company might become, mm. and what the products are, who mm. is needed to be brought along to get the right set of skills. Mm. All of that is involved mm. in a successful mm. venture capital. So that's not very different from mm. uh, being an industrialist. Mm. Mm. So, so what, uh, what turned out... Um, over the years is that what we had thought originally would be um, maybe a corner of very interesting science. Mm. Uh, it, it turns out that these structures work very much better than we dared hope. Uh, and it's interesting, there's been a little checklist of things I had been assured by distinguished colleagues would never work. <laughs> they, they, they were all wrong, every time. It's amazing what, mm. amazing what you shouldn't believe. I've been through this with the computer revolution. We'll never get machines that can translate natural yes. languages and so on you, and so on. You just, mm. you just shouldn't take this too seriously. Mm. So, so uh, that, that sort of sense of... I mean, it, it was never planned that it would turn out to be so useful. Mm. Um, but, but it has turned out to be useful, so you just have to grab the opportunity and do it. Mm. And, and in what way... Will it be useful? I mean, at what point will we notice the world changing because of this? Well, the, the, uh, in, various, uh, in various ways. I mean, the, the, the problem with speaking to camera this afternoon is mm. that you know, maybe next year um, the answer will be completely different. <laughs> this is That's all right, it's years. stated. <laughs> it's stated. I mean, the, the, the current big push is with, with uh, plastic logic, which uh, I had a role in finding in 2000. Um, mm. And plastic logic has um, found we have a very, very good technology for being able to put down um, huge numbers of surprisingly good transistors, which are made out of plastic, onto a sheet of plastic. Um, and those we're using to switch a display, uh, a, a sort of electronic paper-like display, which is also flexible. So we end up with a display that um, feels like a sort of laminated card. At mm. the moment the active area is A5 size. It's quite substantial. Mm. About one and a half million transistors in it. Gosh. And that I think is going to be what everyone has always wanted to be able to read, say, on the bus or on the train. Mm. 
the, the quality is the quality of the quality is it feels like reading black on white it mm. has the weight of um, a lightweight book mm. uh, you can bend it you, know, you, do, you, you don't turn over the pages so you just course. press a button and, mm. the, and, the, and the page will, will change mm. um, so the only the, the, I'm not sure what format will be finally used but we've we are, we are um, spending lots of other people's money building a manufacturing plant in Germany oh, yeah. Yeah. to manufacture these. And uh, by this time next year, we'll know whether it's hit, hit the market successfully or not. But that, that could be big. Mm. Uh, there are, uh, with Cambridge Display Technology and the light emitting diodes, uh, it's, it, it's, been a lot, uh, it's been hard, but the, uh, we now have uh, astonishingly good um, full color displays. They're not flexible. Yet there are practical reasons for that, but they they're better than the crystal displays for TV, and um, and that company has ended up being uh, Japanese owned. Um, a lot of that part of the display industry is necessarily going to stay in Asia, hmm. but I believe that technology will find its way into uh, top performing displays for computers. For, well, for computers, mobile phones, hmm. where performance. Um, Absolutely to premium, hmm. and then the, the 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 big area which may turn out to be very important is making low cost solar cells, where silicon is fundamentally too expensive. And what one I think needs is a technology which is cheap to make, cheap to deploy, maybe doesn't last forever, but by the time it's worn out, it has many times over um, paid for itself in terms of carbon dioxide not generated. Would the, um, when you say solar cells, I know nothing. Are these things that capture, uh, capture sunlight. sunlight and produce mm. electricity? I remember reading an astonishing fact, which was that if you could get, you know, an effective system that would capture even a small proportion of the sun's energy and cover, you know, a, quite a small area of. At that time, it was said the Sahara Desert, which is not perhaps where you put it, but uh, you know, you could produce an enormous amount of energy. There is. Sunlight is essentially the only truly unlimited energy resource we have. Mm. You could meet the entire energy requirements of the USA today by coating the state of Kansas with not particularly efficient solar cells. It would have to be over the whole surface. Over of the whole Kansas. surface. But Kansas is a small fraction of the USA. Mm. That's all it would take. And that would... That, I missed the crucial bit. That would be enough for the USA. The, well, the USA is accounts for a quarter of world energy mm. consumption mm. at the moment, and that would be the whole of the USA. Mm. So, if you, if you could look at maps of the world with you know, four such areas: Australia, Australia, <laughs> Australia Saudi Arabia, the mm. Sahara, mm. and that's world energy consumption. So, is, it, is this going to be possible? Uh, things are possible. Uh, there are. Um, There are sort of reality checks, and if you, at the moment, solar cells which are, are made out of silicon, um, and it's a very expensive technology, mm. it requires a lot of energy to make them. Mm. And I haven't done the calculation myself, it's very hard to check, but I'm assured that if I were to put a solar panel on my roof and leave it switched on all the time, so that every coulomb of electricity that came out of that solar cell avoided some fossil fuel generated electricity, it would take five years before it had paid back the carbon used to make it and put it on the roof. I which is a depressing thought. Thought you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you've got to bring that sort of payback time down. But you're, the, what you were saying earlier is that you're developing an alternative to silicon. We, we, we may be able to do it. We have. I mean, they're not good enough at the moment, but, mm. um, but there's a significant chance that this is a route to the sort of l a low enough cost, larger area. Mm technology to uh, make, make a big impact on uh, energy. Mm. That would be wonderful. You will be a saint. You will be <laughs> our saviour. I think sainthood would be entirely inappropriate. <laughs> I, think that's I mean, you, yes. you, you'd be simultaneously a saint and also the devil, because uh, mm. my wife is a second-hand bookseller, and she asked me to ask you whether your um, plastic books, if we can mm. call them that, will mean the end of the book. I don't know. I don't think so. I think um, I mean, technology has is, is 
always has un unintended consequences, doesn't it? Um, the the uh, I mean, information revolution is is sort of good. I mean, the uh, the availability, of the, the, the one's ability to track down an out of print book now mm. Mm. Um, through the internet mm. means that I now go tracking books which are out of print. Mm. Previously, I wouldn't have bothered. Yeah. I, I, and there are always positives. Mm. I, I think we watch more films now than we did when before television, etc., etc. Well, as it happens, I'm very bad at watching films. <laughs> I don't seem to find myself um, mm. feeling I have the time. I, I don't know what's going to happen, I, but mm. I, the, the, the ridiculous you know, unavailability of most of the stuff you'd like to read because mm. it's it's out of print and, and unavailable um, is probably going to be a thing of the past. Mm. I don't think we're going to lose our interest in being able to have books, mm. but uh, I don't have the same sentiment about newspapers. If, mm. I, if I could um, put the content of whatever form of opinion that masquerades as fact um, mm -hmm. that I choose to want to read and um, put that through my mobile phone onto mm -hmm. my plastic logic display and then read it on the train or whatever, I think I'd rather do that than uh, get sort of newsprint all over my fingers mm -hmm. um, and, throw away the and paper. then throw the paper away. I don't, I don't think I feel badly about that. That actually sort of answers the question, because I was wondering whether these devices would have Wi-Fi built into them. But it sounds as if you would actually have the device for capturing the book off the internet yeah, on a phone or something and then plug it in. Well, since we all have those anyway, mm. that would be an obvious option. But and of course, um, you the could technology never turns it quite like what you expect it to be. Could you, could you actually put a sort of keyboard on these things as well? You, you could do. I mean, the 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 the, uh, the virtue is that um, what we like to read mm. is stuff. That, I mean, we particularly as we get older and our mm. eyes are less accommodating, we actually like to hold something which needs to be lightweight, mm. a pretty accurate distance, mm. a precise distance away from our eyes. Yeah. Um, and you don't really want to have that cluttered up with a keyboard. I mean, that, mm. they, you know, books have been. Uh, no, I was thinking you could switch the keyboard on and off. Oh, you, you may be able to do that. Mm. Yes. The problem is that I don't think I don't think there's a universal device. I, I, I think we I, I think the business of reading information has has not had the attention it's deserved. Mm -hmm. We've been more concerned about um, being able to do everything on the same device. Mm -hmm. So I've I may this may prove to be entirely outdated. <laughs> well, to me watch today. this interview in it took three years yes. and see how yes. right you were. Um, I was going to. Uh, ask about, I mean, we haven't gone on with your career, you, you moved up through the hierarchy, mm -hmm. assistant lecturer, lecturer, all the time in Cambridge, or did you go elsewhere? Well, I've had, uh, I've had sabbaticals elsewhere, um, but I, I was always rather proud that I never got thrown out of Cambridge, and now I think perhaps I should have been. <laughs> I, I've never had a, 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 another job in the UK, university mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, my excuse is that I suppose getting involved, starting uh, the two companies um, was a sort of it was outside the university and it provided a, I mean, a pretty major diversion mm. at, at various times and I think that provided a sort of diversity of experience mm. that I don't think I would have had if I had been just mainstream in mm. the university. Mm. Have you spent much time, you mentioned America a little bit, have you spent any time, for example, in East Asia? Um, do, do you know what's happening in Japan and China, for instance, or India? I, I um, have been many times to Japan, because of mm. course in my world Japan mm. has been a major player. Mm. I, as it happens, have very good links with Singapore, largely because I had an absolutely brilliant research student um, from Singapore, who's now a professor there, and mm. we, uh, we enjoy working together. Mm. And I have um, some limited contact with India, um, and China I've never really gone to grips with. Mm. I think the problem for me is that I can only do so much, mm. and I suppose I'm sort of jealous of those opportunities that lead very directly to 
that things are going to happen in my lab. Mm. And I, not, I don't think I've fully understood what uh, the, uh, the rapidly growing Asian economies are, are very interesting, but mm. they're not exactly the same thing as what I think my academic work is. Mm. You don't have any sense of, because I spend some time in Chinese universities and including technical universities and ask them about the progress of mm. computing and other subjects there. And they, they, each time I ask them, they, the time span between them catching up with Western mm. science lessons, um, they seem optimistic that they're learning enough to be effective. But are they having much impact yet in? Well, China in particular on well, physics. Uh, China, uh, I, mean, I think uh, you know, the, 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 the notion that somehow Western systems um, are more creative than mm. Eastern systems is um, last century's view. I don't mm. believe that's true at all. Mm. And the, the sort of de skilling of the West mm. uh, and the um, upskilling of the East is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> terrifying? Terrifying. I don't see how. I don't see how Western economies will cope. I, we, I don't know what we have to offer the East. That's very interesting. Mm. I, I mean, I tend to agree with you. I mean, we we have the English language, <laughs> and a few. Um, well, it's a sort of Europe as a theme park, with, yes. uh, with, with uh, and, and the English have the virtue of a different variant of. Mm. A, a variant of American mm. English. Um, it's not really what I want to build on. <laughs> I, I do find it terrifying that uh, there is so little appreciation um, of you know, the virtues of, of uh, technology and engineering. Mm. We, 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 uh, it, it, I think we've been through a very damaging decade where we've We've seen manufactured goods become absurdly cheap because mm. they've been outsourced to principally China. Mm. And we've failed to appreciate how sophisticated and, uh, and, and complex and wonderful they are. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea how to make them now. Yes, I've been visited Chinese factories and seen them. They are wonderful, mm. amazing, and Japanese. Um, just returning to physics for a moment, uh, I've it sounds as if your branch of physics is very, very alive and going very fast in interesting directions. Mm. I, I have talked to other physicists mm. and mm. people like Martin Rees and so on, mm. and they've, they've um, painted a picture of a rather more kind of post-paradigmatic shift and a, a plateau that, that we've got to the edge of the kinds of work that physicists can do because of the current state of the technologies and so on. Is, is that true of some branches of physics, that they are on a level with the great discoveries? In well, physicists have been worrying about this for a very long time. Um, Maxwell, in his inaugural lecture as the first Cambridge professor in 1873, um, uh, dwelt on this for a while. Mm. Um, he had said that, it, you know, he said that it was generally put about that physics was essentially complete and that mm. the, the remaining job was to measure some fundamental constants to higher precision. Mm. Of course, he didn't agree with that proposition. <laughs> it was a subject limited by our, our imaginations. And mm. Of course, he was right. Mm. That was just before the great, you know, the great quantum mm. revolution. Mm. Only if, if one looks back, one would have to say that, that um, the, the dawn of quantum mechanics mm. um, Probably very much underrated uh, role that Maxwell played in the uh, 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 significance of, of um, electromagnetic uh, mm. theory is just just astonishing. So the sense that there are um, discoveries from physics which will change everyday perception mm. from reality um, probably it's hard to see how that's going to happen in such a profound way as happened in the first part of the twentieth century. Mm. But that, I don't think that takes the, the pleasure mm. or anticipation or sense of discovery away. Mm. 
and, and, and maybe it's a bit of a diversion. I, mean, I don't think that we used to imagine that we had to completely change the universe uh, mm. through our discoveries. I mean, a lot of a lot of the best science is often low-key, small-scale, mm. just good, brilliant observation. Um, there's plenty mm. of that to do, mm. and it does, of course, um, raise the question as to what is physics. Uh, and of course, um, physics isn't really a subject. Mm. Um, I don't know. Um, the, the people who uh, spotted that we had a zo an ozone hull over the Antarctic. Mm. Um, I don't know whether they were physicists, but I'm sure they're physical scientists. Mm. That may have been one of the most momentous observations in recorded history. Mm. It may turn out to have been that. I don't know. Mm. But the impact that you know, good physics or the application of the methods of physics can make on mm. what appear to be huge challenges with uh, uh, sustain uh, sustainable uh, um, environment is probably going to be critical. Mm. And I can't think of a more important time to have the tools that come mm. from, well, not just physics, but if you like, the numerous sciences. Mm. It's absolutely critical. Mm. Well, you gave a very good example with light, uh, sun conversion and years before. Um, and there would be no doubt many others. Um, I, you said something about not uh, want, wanting to guard your laboratory time jealously, mm -hmm. or something like this, where rather than going away and spending time in lots of other places, which leads me to ask what, what I often ask about how people work. And you also mentioned this in relation to having fun and not sort of sitting at your desk with a telephone and ready to answer it all the time. How, how do you think and work and create? Uh, I, 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 I don't really get into the lab. I, that's just not possible given the brown I've got um, in the university. I, so a lot of what I do is, is, is you know, within the group, you know, a, a lot of toying with ideas, planning experiments, dissecting observations and working out what what didn't fly. Mm. Um, um, I don't really like doing that in a formal setting. I mean, it's, it's often a sort of chance discussion that, that happens. Where? Somewhere around in the Cavendish, probably. Around the Cavendish, yes. yeah. But then I also done a lot of my work is um, sort of sits at the, the, the boundaries with, um, a, a lot of it is with chemistry. I, mm. Benefited from being able to get access to materials or get people to make materials which I can make, um, mm. where I can see where we can do something good with it. So uh, I've had some wonderful um, working relationships with, with a, a great number of chemists. Mm. Um, and there the pleasure is actually being a rank amateur at chemistry, mm. but enjoying, but it not mattering, that, mm. that where we understand that the prize is to make the connections mm -hmm. where we, you know, both sides are fumbling to understand one another's worlds. Mm -hmm. And that of course tends to happen outside Cambridge, although I have some very good collaborations with, with people in the chemistry department here. Mm -hmm. So I think what I was alluding to earlier is that it's very easy to sort of go on the grand circuit mm -hmm. and be, be grand. When, I mean, what, I mean, either you have no visibility or else you have too much. Mm -hmm. and I th think, and I don't think I'm very good at it, I think one has to be relatively selfish about mm. understanding what you're after, what's, you know, when is a visit somewhere likely to generate mm. you know, the next good idea. Mm. And of course it doesn't always happen to order. Mm. And do those good ideas, I mean the, the larger ideas, tend to occur when you're in conversation with people or when you're doing experiments or when you're in your garden, or walking, or on holiday, or all of the above, all of them. Because mm. yeah. most accounts of scientific breakthroughs, like mm. Poincaré or Einstein or any of the rest of them, usually paint a picture of intense concentration on a problem, and then putting it on one side. Absolutely, the, the, the moment when suddenly you have a 
perspective on something um, can happen. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm the moments of when I'm extremely stressed about something rather mundane but important that I'm worrying about, or sometimes it may be when I'm relaxed. I don't, I don't think I part of the pattern. Can you give any example of uh, one of these moments? I can be, I, I, I'm very bad at being able to recall these things, having talked in general terms. <laughs> um, if I, in the back of my mind, I will turn this one over. And if okay, I, I if you think of any, yes. tell me when you come and visit us. Thank yes, you. yes, yes. Um, uh, that moment, you know, when the world suddenly... I mean, uh, Sidney Brenner gives one or two examples, um, mm. and there are a few people. It doesn't happen so much in biology, but mm. um, it would be very nice if you think of any instances. I, can I, mean, I can remember ideas that I've had, but I'm actually not very good at remembering exactly when I had them. Mm. Um, idea that we that, that got the work on the transistors going probably arose um, in the back of, uh, on, on a train journey back from EP labs in Sunbury after a sort of desultory meeting that didn't go very well. I think it did. That's interesting. It was on the bus journey back from the south of France that Poincaré solved one of his great mathematical problems. Mm. And he remembers the second as he put his foot on the bus mm step, or the coach step, and it was in that second, just as Darwin solved his second, the second part of the theory of evolution, in the moment that the coach hit a rock, mm. and he was thrown in the air, between being thrown in the air and landing back on the seat, mm. he'd solved the problem. I, I love those. <laughs> ah, uh, yes, yes. Um, well, of course, for me, half the time, the, if you like, the solving of the problem is what turns up when the experiment is done, mm. and that's that, that's the, the that's the way I like science to go. But then there is the formulating of what it is that one should try and do, mm. which is not quite the same thing as a sort of eureka moment. Mm. But you can probably look back and say, well, there was a point when you sort of when I advanced it beyond the point where everyone else knew what to do, mm. and that's not not quite as distinct. Seen something as well. It's just reshaping the question a little bit. Yes. Mm. Yes. And why we don't? Why don't we do that experiment? Why mm. can't we do that? Mm. Well, this is why. I mean, I, I know nothing about physics. My account, how you work, is from Descartes, and mm. um, who seems to give this mechanistic idea of moving along a chain from the known facts to experiments. Uh, that isn't how you work. I don't think it's that mechanistic. I, I think you have a sort of hunch that there are things that people don't really understand and in some preferably large sort of green field that has not been trampled on by anyone else. And you don't quite know what you're going to find, but you know you can get to that field because you've worked out that there are things that you can measure that no one else has thought of measuring or would have thought it would be possible to measure, or whatever. And that's probably rather imprecise, but that's not a bad way to go. No, it's a very nice image. Uh, but but all, what the most important thing is to know where the green fields are. It's knowing where we probably are deluding ourselves if we think we know what we're going to find. <laughs> that's even better. Um, I always ask whether there's, I mean, there's a lot of your life, there's your family life mm. with your wife and your grown up daughters, there's uh, no doubt many other things, but is there anything large that I should have asked you about and haven't? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I think I might have mentioned that I, and you haven't asked me the sort of nice question of what are my hobbies, but, uh, but yes. in some ways the, I felt rather distanced from laboratory work as part of everyday mm. life and that's part of the, part of a lot of the modern mm. um, research grant holder in, mm. in a British university that mm. uh, it's the sort of it somehow feels like a sort of meta activity that writing a good research grant proposal that gets funded is almost the same thing as discovering some good science <laughs> mm. uh, and I um, 
sometimes um, um, frivolously uh, contemplate rather than producing a, a an autobiography or a collection of, of, of essays and actual um, publishing a, a, a set of my grant proposals. <laughs> Since they've occupied too much of uh, yes, I, What, what would you call it? Those that worked? Or, yes, um, yes. Yes, yes, perhaps leave it to the reader to work out which should have been fun and which weren't. And <laughs> put in yes. one or two spoof ones as yes, well. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. And have a prize um, for them. But, but, but the sort of practical world I do enjoy. Mm. So, so, um, what are your hobbies? Yeah, well, 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 hobbies, I mean, the, the, well, the life, the home life, uh, we've moved in recently, uh, mm. have a large garden, and I have for the first time a large workshop and a rather professional. Uh, Set of woodworking tools, mm. and I, I think the sort of pleasure of doing you know, doing practical things. So Andrew Huxley is a woodworker too, I think, uh, if I remember recall rightly. Well, I'm pleased to hear that. I wouldn't claim that my woodworking is of the highest order. But it's good enough to be mm. able to turn things out which are very mm. useful, mm. and I, I find that very um, very satisfying. Mm. So mm. these sort of practical skills, I think, uh, one's allowed to have. Mm, indeed. Well, I think that's probably a nice note to end on. So thank you very much indeed, well, thank Richard. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure.